I was in Geneva for a meeting of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And <clears throat> it was my very first IPCC meeting. And the government representatives there were being asked what their governments thought about the summary for policymakers of the most recent IPCC assessment report. They all said the same thing. It's much too scientific. My minister simply cannot read it. Now, in 2014, the US government has issued its third National Climate Assessment, or NCA, and this report had the goal of effective communication incorporated as part of its strategy from the start, built into the process of developing the report and not added on as an afterthought. The first words of this NCA are, quote, climate change, once considered an issue for a distant future, has moved firmly into the present, unquote. The NCA language has been quoted many times, including by President Obama. The graphics in this NCA are superb, and I've already used them in several different talks for very different audiences. I'm going to illustrate this by an example taken from a short uh, TED-type talk that I gave a few weeks ago for a general audience. Here we go. We climate scientists are planetary physicians. I had a fascinating experience recently. My doctor retired. I chose a new doctor. When we met, he said, sit down, let me tell you how I practice medicine. First, I'm competent. I know what I'm doing. Second, I'm honest, and if there's something I don't understand, I'll tell you. Third, I'm here only to advise you. You will make all the decisions. I was really impressed. No doctor had ever talked to me like that before, and there's something else. We climate scientists, planetary physicians, are also competent and honest and only here to advise. Has the world warmed in recent decades? Yes, unequivocally. Here's global average temperature, decade by decade. Every single year in the 1990s and the 2000s has been warmer than the average of the previous decade. This record goes back to the 1800s, and all the warmest years are recent years. There's a lot of evidence for global warming. Here, the white arrows up show increasing trends, and the black arrows down show decreasing trends. So air and ocean temperatures are rising, so is sea level and the amount of water vapor in the air, but glaciers and ice sheets and snow cover and Arctic sea ice are all shrinking. All these trends are signs of a warming world. Like good doctors, we've diagnosed the cause of this warming. It's not natural. For example, it's not the sun. We measure solar output. That's the red curve at the bottom with a clear 11-year solar cycle, but with no upward trend, unlike rising temperature, which is the blue curve at the top. So this warming isn't due to any of the natural factors that we know can change climate. Instead, this warming is human-caused, and the biggest problem is the explosive growth in carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere. It comes chiefly from our main energy source, burning coal and oil and natural gas. We use the atmosphere as a free dump for the waste products, and for climate, carbon dioxide is the worst of them. This famous graph, the Keeling Curve, shows the measured increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide from 1958 until today. This increase is entirely human-caused. The global warming that this large increase would cause was predicted long ago, and now we've observed it. Many of our predictions have already come true, and some aspects of climate change have happened even faster than we predicted. Here's an example of something we don't understand well yet. Arctic sea ice extent is a minimum every year in September, and we've underestimated how rapidly this annual minimum area would shrink as the years go by. In some recent years, like the one shown on the right, it's only half of what it typically was before 2000, as shown on the left. This storm reminds us that global warming is just a symptom of planetary ill health, like a fever. The symptom is not the whole story. 
Many aspects of climate have already changed. Sea level has risen, water vapor in the air has increased, and these two changes alone can contribute to making severe storms such as hurricanes more dangerous because flooding is a major cause of hurricane damage and the higher sea level increases flooding from the ocean while the extra water vapor can increase flooding from heavy rainfall. Here are projected changes late in the present century in precipitation over North America for the four seasons, assuming that emissions will continue to increase. Green is wetter, brown is drier, hatching shows where changes are most significant. In general, wet regions will become wetter, such as the northern U.S. in winter. At the same time, dry regions will become drier, such as the southwestern U.S. in spring. The American West is already arid. Further drying brings many risks, including reduced agricultural productivity and greater wildfire danger. Thus, the extreme drought in California may be a foretaste of the future. Southern California imports much of its water from the Sierra Snowpack and the Colorado River, and both these water sources are shrinking. The world is addicted to fossil fuels. The advice of us planetary physicians is simple and clear. End this addiction. To limit global warming to moderate levels, we have to drastically reduce our emissions of the heat-trapping gases that come from burning fossil fuels. There's no silver bullet that solves this problem, but there's lots of silver buckshot, including energy efficiency and conservation, and much more use of sun, wind, and water. These renewable resources are widely available now and already cost competitive with fossil fuels. We have the technology. We have lacked the political will to act. How should we encourage clean energy? Many thoughtful people have advocated a carbon tax, but climate scientists aren't tax experts. We're all specialists. You don't ask a cardiologist about a root canal, and you don't ask a dentist about heart surgery. People should first listen to experts on taxes and energy policy, and then decide. Here's the warming expected by late in the present century. On the right is the United States if emissions keep increasing. We get seven or eight degrees Fahrenheit more warming. On the left is the future if emissions are greatly reduced, only three or four degrees of warming. That's a huge difference. That's the choice we have. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide is building up in the atmosphere. The window of opportunity in which to make this choice will soon close. What to do about global warming should not depend on your politics. It should be about how all of us want to avoid polluting and contaminating this magnificent world and about how to protect and preserve our amazing planet. So I'm a climate scientist and we're planetary physicians. So remember these three things. First, we're competent. We know what we're doing. Second, we're honest. When there's something we don't understand, we'll tell you. So listen to your doctor. You learn something important, but don't forget we're only here to advise. It's you who will make all the decisions. That's the end of the TEDx talk. So the conclusions that I want to leave you with are that the National Climate Assessment is living proof that excellent assessments require not only excellent scientists, but also the skills and talents of many other people, including graphic designers, photographers, website professionals, and scientific communications experts. The result is an NCA report that can illustrate and inform the art of communicating to diverse audiences while staying true to the scientific results. I want to thank uh, two people especially, 
One is Susan Hassel, the senior science writer for the National Climate Assessment, who is also my partner in climatecommunication.org and who will be speaking about the NCA in this room later this morning. And the other is my wife of nearly 50 years, Sylvia Ball Somerville, who was a photographer, and she made all the photographs in my talk. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions for Richard. Do you want me to mic? <clears throat> So I think the uh, inclusion of good graphics is really valuable. Do you see going forward, or I'm just curious what you see going forward um, as media progresses as, you know, beyond good graphics? Are there videos? Are there interactive simulations? What would you recommend for the next IPCC or the next, you know, other sort of summary sort of reports to do the things that scientists aren't as great at necessarily at producing the really high quality graphics, the photographs and so forth? of you know, other media specialists sort of chipping in to help support talks like this? I think that's a wonderful question, and I would love to see the IPCC, which uh, I've always said gets A plus for scientific assessment and a gentleman's C for communication, uh, do better in those areas. I think the problem typically for the IPCC has been twofold. One is that not all the governments involved are interested in clear scientific communication of uh, solid science. And the other is that those people don't work for free. We, the scientists who've been authors of the IPCC reports, aren't paid by IPCC. We're paid by our own employers, my university in my case. And uh, the graphics and website and uh, professional science writing people can't work for free. And the IPCC has a little tiny budget and so far hasn't been able to buy that kind of expertise and pay those people. And I hope that changes. Another question down back there. Hi. So, you know, you were very clear about, I like the ending, you know, this is the choice, this is the time window with the choice, but as you know, I mean, I work with a lot of, I've worked with a lot of climate scientists about the science, and so everybody sort of, when they say, how long, how long before we act, they say, well, we're advising, we're not telling you what to do, and it includes many human choices, they go into that whole thing. So I'm wondering, after the climate assessment, what have you seen with um, the clarity about how scientists can say, this is your choice, uh, you know, a hotter world or a really hotter world, mm -hmm. and this is your window. Because I feel like we're clear on so many other things, but not that. So, yeah, what do I you think see? I completely sympathize with you. I think that the scientists have tried to do a good job at, at conveying the urgency of this. This is not a problem like slavery or giving the women the vote or civil rights that can be done generations on a time scale, years and years. This is something that we only have a limited amount of time and the physics is the reason. It's nothing to do with politics. It's that the CO2 builds up in the atmosphere and it's the cumulative emissions that determine the magnitude of the climate change. And I think we've said this as loudly and clearly as we can. If we could do it better, let's do it better. It's in the NCA. Right. It's in a lot of other reports. But I think this urgency doesn't bubble to the surface at meetings like the one in Lima where the governments have to take action. I, I just think scientists keep mumbling on that because they, they're worried about the advising, not, you know, deciding. So thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much.